back to Wesley. It's good to see all of you. If you want to stand, we're going we're gonna to sing some songs together. January 27th and 29th, we're having a college retreat. It's called Reform All Things New. Those of you who remember Feet First from back in the day, this is kind of Feet First reimagined. So that's going to be at Camp Bay's Mountain, and our very own Caleb Frazier is going to be one of those speakers, so duh, you have to go. Uh, it's $75, and that includes four meals, a climbing tower, archery, etc. So that sounds like fun. I'm going to be there, so come on up for that. And my final announcement is that every Monday from 3 to 5 p.m., I will be here making grilled cheese sandwiches for free. So if you want a grilled cheese, come on Monday. Hot cheese Mondays. Yes. That's all I got. Are there any announcements from the floor tonight? There will be food at the lock-in. There will be food at the lock-in. Yeah. I think that's it. Uh, Curtis McGee, would you come forward? And uh, while Curtis comes up, I'm going to introduce our speaker tonight, Reverend Sarah Barnell, a good friend, who shared with us. And uh, you all know Sarah, and uh, 
Uh, she's a pastor at Trinity United Methodist Church in Greenville. It's a great church to go to if you head in the Greenville area. Come on up, Curtis. And um, so thanks, Sarah, for joining us tonight. Uh, Curtis will be joining our leadership team. Curtis, as a member of the Wesley leadership team, will you faithfully participate in his ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say, I will. I will. Members of the Wesley community, I commend Curtis to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase his faith, confirm his hope, and perfect him in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. The God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. We all join me in welcoming Curtis to leadership.
Tuhan si. I did other things. 
Um, and so what I noticed was that like I started kind of gaining some weight because I still ate like I played soccer, you know? Um, and so it didn't really work out for me so much in that process. So I decided my first year of college that I had access to a gym on campus that was free to me. And I was like, that is my New Year's resolution. I am gonna go to the gym every day so I can eat all the ice cream I want because I love ice cream and they had free ice cream in the cafeteria, or at least it was free to me. I mean, my parents, but whatever, you know? <laughs> so I go to the gym day one. Awesome, do great, it's great. It, I'm worn out, I'm sweating, I hate sweating. I hate having to like wash my hair again. That's the worst part. Thank God for dry shampoo. That was not a thing 20 years ago. So anyway, great first day, it was great. Second day, I invite a friend. That went okay, but my friend made me nervous because I felt like she was watching me the whole time. I don't know if she was, but I felt like she was, like she was comparing herself to me. Um, secret, I was comparing myself to her. Um, I just put that on her. So I didn't invite her the third day. So the third day, I walk in the gym, and there's already this guy there, and he's on the treadmill, and I was headed to the treadmill, and he was running like a pretty good pace and sweating a lot, and I looked over at his time, and I thought, oh gosh, he's about to finish, okay? So I get on the treadmill beside him, and I start my walking warm-up, and then I'm like, well, I can't walk next to, you know, Johnny Awesome over here. So I pick up the pace a little bit, and I'm still not keeping up with him. I keep picking up the pace where I'm finally keeping up with this guy. He goes on for another 15 minutes, not just a couple more, 15 then he has a cool down. I'm not at cool down mode, so I'm like keeping up the really fast pace. Then he gets down and he stretches and takes his time drying off his face. And the whole time I'm like, I'm going to die. I am about to have a heart attack. I like my second wind never came. So finally he walks out. I never saw this guy again on campus. I don't know why I care what he thought of me. But as soon as he walked out and the door shut, I fell off of the thing, and then I did not go back. I never went back to the gym the rest of my time in college at Emory and Henry because that, that was not a good resolution for me. I've gotten smart in my resolutions some year. There was one year where I decided I was going to be like my best friend, who is this awesome, organized, type A personality. I'm one of those people that's afflicted with being a perfectionist without any of the discipline. So like I want it to be perfect, but I don't actually put in the time to make things perfect. So I'm just constantly frustrated with anybody else like that? Yeah. No? Okay, cool. Well anyway, she's one of those people that, y'all are my people, I'm glad. Um, she's one of those people that puts in the time, everything's perfect. And so um, she always had this like plan of when our assignments were. We were in seminary together at Duke. And she always had this plan of when assignments were. And I thought, gosh, I need to get a planner. And like write in my planner when my assignments are. And then I won't realize the night before that I have a paper due tomorrow. Oh, two papers due tomorrow. Oh, and a test that I'll like have of a plan. Even though I work really good under pressure, y'all. Like that is my jam. Under pressure with donuts, I'm all about that. <laughs> but seminary is kind of a big deal. So I had to up my game. I went and I got a planner. And that was my New Year's resolution that year. In the middle of my first year of seminary was... I'm going to get organized. It is time. It's time to get organized. So I walk in my apartment. I show her my planner. I'm so proud of it. She's so proud of me. And uh, then she takes me back to her room, and she's like, well, I already put up my assignments, too. And I'm like, oh, let me see your planner. That woman opens her door, and on the wall is a calendar for the semester pasted on the wall. We had three of four of the same classes. She had written out all the reading assignments, all of the assignments, all of the tests, when they were due, color-coded them on the wall. I still had an empty planner. That year I got smart, and I just went in her room every time I needed to know what was on the planner. <laughs> so, you know, that year I kept my resolution, but it was thanks to Jody that I kept my, my resolution. You all might know her. She's the pastor at First UMC here in Johnson City. She's so awesome. Okay, resolutions. Make me think of something else. I saw this really cheesy sign on a church of God that said, people make resolutions, God makes promises. And usually I kind of laugh at those church signs because they're usually ridiculous. But when I read that, I thought, gosh, yes, amen. That is a whole sermon. People make resolutions, God makes promises. And God keeps 
God's promises. So what are God's promises? That might be the next question you're asking yourself. Well, like a good elder millennial theologian, I pulled out my iPhone and I Googled, what are God's promises? I have an MDiv. There's no way to master divinity, by the way, um, but Google, very helpful. So I looked that up and I found a lot of lists. One list was a list of 10. One was a list of 47, okay? One was a list of 161. Another that was 200 promises. And each of these lists had a lot of scripture to back up the list of promises that they had. And I decided that that was all too much. And then I was going to boil it down to two things I could remember. God's promises are, one, the promise of faithfulness. Meaning that God will always be there for us and with us. We sang about that tonight. The second promise is that God promises to put us to work. Now, in church, we say call us to ministry, but that's churchy for get to work for the Lord. God promises to use our hands and our feet and our minds and our hearts. God promises to engage us in some kind of ministry. Now, yesterday was Martin Luther King Jr. Day, King Day, Happy King Day, everybody. And it made me think of a quote that is thrown around this time of year by MLK. Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? God promises to be faithful to us, to be with us, to put us to work so that we can show others that God has already been with them and is with them as well. Not only has God been there, God has done everything and experienced everything and seen it all take place. And God welcomes us every single time. And then God promises, like the song that we sang tonight, to take those, those pain and use them for good if we're willing. If we're willing to let God use that for God's glory. God promises faithfulness. And God promises to put us to work. And God does not break those promises. It doesn't matter who you are. No qualifications on our end. Here's the really cool thing about God's promise of faithfulness. We don't have to be faithful to God for God to be faithful to us. Have you ever thought about that? We don't have to be faithful to God for God to be faithful to us. We don't have to believe that we're good at anything for God to be able to use us and put us to meaningful work in ministry. When I was in seminary, I heard this great story that I have told way too many times, but I love it. It's about Bishop Will Willimon. He was the dean at Duke when I was there. He's now a retired United Methodist bishop. And he tells a story about a time that he took a group of college students, because he was the dean of the chapel, um, on a mission trip. They went on this medical mission trip over spring break. Now, students at Duke are like pretty intense human beings for the most part, especially the undergrads. Um, and they have been programmed that they are going to do something really special and smart with their lives. And so they're all working on these really special and smart degrees, and it's a very intense environment. Um, you can tell the difference between the undergrads and the graduate students by the look of intensity, like truly. The grad students have like Hondas and broken down cars and sweatshirts and torn up jeans and their hair might be brushed. The undergrads, they got it all going on. Okay, it's a very intense environment. And Bishop Willimon took this group of students to um, this medical mission trip in South America. And one of the students that he took, she had been raised, she was an only child, and she had been raised to be a doctor. And she was in school, in undergrad, getting her pre-med degree so that she could go on and get her um, PhD, or MD, I said the wrong thing. See, I'm not polished and smart. Um, to get an MD. She goes on this medical mission trip, and she comes home, and she calls her parents, and she says, that trip changed my life. She's like, I no longer want to work at one of the premier hospitals in the United States. I want to be a medical missionary. And her parents are like, are you, are you sure? <clears throat> like, what kind of money can you make being a medical missionary? And she's like, I don't care about that. I feel like I'm supposed to do this. I feel like God has prepared me for this. I feel like I'm supposed to do this thing. Well, her dad talked to her mom, and they decided that they better talk to this chaplain, this Caleb, at Duke. Calls Bishop Willimon, who 
you know, was the dean of the chapel at the time, and says, our little girl, just went on your trip. She had a great time, but she told us that she doesn't want to be a doctor in a hospital, in a research hospital anymore. Her, her trajectory has totally changed, all because of one week. And Bishop Willimon was like, oh, did you raise your daughter in church? And the dad was like, yeah, what does this have to do with that? He's like, and uh, when was she baptized? He said, well, in her case, she, she's an infant. He's like, okay. And I guess you were there for that, right? And Bishop Willimon was, and the father was like, of course we were there for our baby daughter's baptism. What I'm calling you about is you need to get my daughter straightened out. She needs to get her life back on track. I don't want to talk about baptism. I know you're a preacher. And Bishop Willimon said, this isn't my fault. This is yours. You gave her to God. You raised her to give her heart to God. God has been faithful to her and to you. And God has called her to do something for the kingdom. This is your fault. I'm guessing the dad didn't have much to say at that point. The bishop, Willemont, doesn't tell the rest of the story. God is faithful. And God promises to put us to work. Now, I don't know what your all stories are. Each of you have your own stories, your own journeys that you're on with God. You're in your own places with God along that journey. And there's no rush to make big, wild decisions because God is in the midst of every moment of your life. God brought you to ETSU for a reason. You're here at Wesley for a purpose. And God wants to use you if you're willing to allow God to do just that. Some of you may have been baptized as infants or children or teenagers. Some of you here may have never been baptized. I know if you've never been baptized and you'd like to have that conversation with Caleb, he's, his door is open all the time. And that is an in-depth conversation to be had with someone that you trust and love and who can guide you and pray over you in that process. I thought tonight, with it being a new year and the first Wesley back, that the right thing would be to remember that God is faithful and that God has promised to put us to work. And so I'd like to do a remembering our baptism time. And what we're going to do is I'm going to say a prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to be present in this act of water and of placing water. And what you're invited to do is, if you want, you can come forward. If no one comes forward, I, I love remembering my baptism. I'll be fine. Don't worry about me. Don't come forward based on pressure. Come forward because it, you feel called to, okay? There's a beautiful worship space over here where you can go and pray by yourself with a friend. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you to come forward, and I'm going to take a little bit of water from this bowl, and then I'm going to put it on your head. And I'm going to say, remember your baptism and that God claims you. If you're not baptized, you can still come forward and look forward to that gift, because whether you're baptized or not, God has already claimed you as well. God wants a relationship with every single human being. We are all siblings in Christ, friends. So I invite you as the band comes back up to play, if you want to come, come and remember your baptism. Let's pray. Holy God, at the beginning of this new year, as we make resolutions, we are reminded of your promise to us to see us through, to hold us, to be with us, to forgive us, and to help us forgive ourselves. Lord, I pray that you pour out your spirit upon this gift of water, this reminder that through the course of time, you have been ubiquitous among us, with us just like pouring water leading us through, guiding us in every step and in every season. Bless this water. Whether we are coming forward to remember that we have already been baptized or whether we are coming forward because we look forward to being baptized. 
Help us all know that we are claimed by you. It's in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll also be taking communion. So how we do this is I'll go ahead and bless the elements, and then if you'd like to come up and remember your baptism, and following that, you can come receive the elements and take time for prayer. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He gave thanks, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, take eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the supper, he took the cup. He again gave thanks. He blessed it. He said, this is my blood, my very life, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Will you pray with me? God, we pray now that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, and your Holy Spirit, and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever, and all of God's children's sake. 